All right, folks, let's get started. Um, I apologize for being super late. Just could not discontinue the other panel um, that was before us in the other room because the discussion was so engrossing. Um, so we will still spend an hour. Uh, I guess we'll just roll the delay further down and try and recover over dinner. Um, that's the penalty we pay. Uh, OK. So the discussion today that we want to have is about uh, developing political skills. But somewhat knowingly, I think I lied to you when we shared that uh, topic of, of panel discussion today. Because the discussion that we really want to have is, is what can we learn from some of the elected members, some of the appointed members on this panel that I'll introduce in a bit. What can we learn from them as mentors ourselves to the next generation of our kids who want to run for public office, who want to get appointments in administrations? And I'm sure there's a few of us over here who may at some point decide to run, so this is uh, also an opportunity for us to um, ask questions, clear some doubts, and learn again, just as we want our mentors to be learning. Um, we cannot really have this discussion until unless I really introduce in detail uh, some of the members over here because I want to bring different perspectives. Uh, and I know that some of the members have either self-introduced themselves or uh, have been introduced in the morning, but I still want to highlight some aspects that have not been shared about them. So in no particular order, let me start with uh, Aziz Hanifa. Uh, for those of you who do not know him, Aziz has been covering U.S.-South Asia relations and Indian American community uh, news based in Washington for over 35 years. In September 2004 and October 2004, he was the first and only South Asian journalist to have done back-to-back -back exclusive interviews for both President George Bush and Democratic presidential challenger Senator John F. Kerry. Uh, Aziz was also the only South Asian journalist who was part of the White House press delegation that accompanied former President Bill Clinton to the subcontinent, and by that I mean the Indian subcontinent, in 2000. He was also the first South Asian journalist to interview the, the then Senator Barack Obama during the presidential campaign in 2007 and 2008. Aziz uh, has a bachelor's degree, uh, double majoring in English and economics, and a master's degree in political science and international affairs from George Washington University. The other thing highlighting over here, because this is uh, worth highlighting, because this is the right place, is that Aziz was the first journalist to be honored with a special award by the Hindu American Foundation and the Sikh Council on Religious and Education, on religion and education for his objective reporting and analysis of the Hindu American and Sikh American communities. Also in 2006, he received a special award for the US India Business Council and the US India Friendship Council for his sustained reporting, analyses, and commentary on US India civilian U.S.-India Civilian Nuclear Deal. That's a big deal. In 2014, Aziz received the Lifetime Achievement Award for Excellence in Journalism from the Global Organization of People of Indian Origin, or GOPIA. Welcome, Aziz. Thank you. The next person I want to shed some light, uh, more light on, uh, although she did that, is uh, the Honorable Judge uh, Sinla Pasai over here. Um, she was appointed, and this is important to recognize, that she was appointed to the Multnomah County Circuit Court by Governor Kate Brown and was sworn in as a circuit judge court in September of 2021. She's assigned to the court's general trial docket, presiding over both civil and criminal matters. Uh, she was born in Laos, as she shared earlier, uh, came to America as a refugee, as she again mentioned, um, but what is impressive is that with all of that in her early childhood, uh, she, despite those uh, setbacks, earned her Bachelor's of Arts in English and Philosophy from Santa Clara University in 1998 and her JD from Northwestern School of Law at Lewis and Clark College uh, in 2002. 
As an attorney, she tirelessly advocates for the community, especially marginalized communities throughout the litigation system. Uh, outside of the court, uh, she loves spending time with her family, hiking, reading books, and cooking with her family. Welcome. We also have Islam Siddiqui, who um, introduced himself through a lot of stories, but never did so formally, so I will take the opportunity to do that. Ambassador Siddiqui served in the Obama administration fr from 2010 to 2014 as chief agricultural negotiator with the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, Executive Office of the President. He was responsible for bilateral and multilateral negotiations and policy coordination regarding agricultural trade, including the TTP, TTIP, and WTO negotiations. In this capacity, Dr. Siddiqui played an active role in the successful 2013 World Trade Organization ministerial meeting in Bali, Indonesia, and in bilateral agricultural trade negotiations with the European Union, Russia, Brazil, and India. Ambassador Siddiqui served as a senior advisor for global food security at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington from 2014 to 2019. Between 1997 and 2001, Dr. Siddiqui served in the Clinton administration in several capacities as the U.S. Ag Department of Agriculture Undersecretary for Marketing and Regulatory Programs, Senior Trade Advisor to Secretary Dan Glickman, and Deputy Undersecretary for Marketing and Regulatory Programs. Dr. Siddiqui was the first president and founding member of the United Muslims of America, UMA, in 1982. UMA's affiliate organization, UMA Interfaith Initiative, continues to promote interfaith understanding among all faiths in the San Francisco Bay Area to this day. In addition, he served as the president and board member of the Sacramento Muslim Mosque Association in the early 1990s. He earned his uh, MS and PhDs, as he mentioned earlier, both from uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, and in 2011, he was awarded the Doctor of Science honorary degree by his alma mater at Pantnagar University in India. Welcome, Dr. Siddiqui. Our next guest to my left is uh, Council Member Anders Fung, who is from the city of Milbrae and was elected to his position in 2020. Uh, Anders was born in Hong Kong and was sworn in as the first generation Chinese American immigrant to serve in the Milbrae City Council. Uh, he currently also serves on the Legislative Committee for the City and County Association of Government of San Mateo County, where he evaluates and opines on all major transportation and housing legislations for the state of California. Anders also served on the General Assembly of the Association of Bay Area Government, as well as serving as the Board of Directors for Peninsula clean energy. Before 2020 election to his current position, he was a Milbrae Planning Commissioner from 2017 to 2020 and chaired the commission from 2019 to 2020. As I mentioned, he, he immigrated to California from Hong Kong and he achieved his Bachelor's of Science degree from uh, computer engineering from a uni Cal California Polyte Polytechnic State University at San Luis Obispo. Welcome, Anders. I must also say before I get started that Anders is the only person I've met uh, who, whose mannerisms and style of speaking is very closely, uh, is, it reminds me of President Obama. So pay attention to that as he speaks. <laughs> All right. So welcome to the panel, everyone. The reason I gave all this introduction uh, to the audience is because I think there are aspects that people associate with certain positions that people get elected to, either in terms of the resume they want to build or the kind of decision influence they want to have. And our goal today is to highlight to them that as we either personally or for our next generation start to think of elected offices, we want to highlight to them different paths that we can all take towards that responsible, political responsibility and play in the game. So that said, let me start with uh, uh, Ambassador Siddiqui. Uh, you have been in some sort of a 
uh, role in government for a long, long time. Quite a bit has changed from the 80s to what it is today. Let us first start with understanding what is different today and going to be different in five years from now that our elected or people who are interested in elected office should be acknowledging, registering in their heads when it comes to specifically being Asian American. Thank you for having me on this panel. Number one, Rajiv, uh, it was a short notice, but I uh, love talking about uh, uh, politics and engagement and civic engagement. So uh, this is the field where I've been working. Uh, and I'm always looking for good trouble, as John Lewis used to say, uh, causes I have adopted for the American Muslim community and in general, the different Indian American community. So when I came as a student um, uh, in the, the University of Illinois, I was a student leader and came to University of California to, for my postdoc, uh, met more uh, community members, including uh, the, the Rajan Anand, the, who is uh, no more, but uh, he and I worked closely in the Clinton administration. And we was always looking, these were the early days of in NFIA and a lot of other work which was going on, including the nuclear agreement. At that time, I think you're working from being outsiders to being insider now. And there were very few of us. Uh, the, the, many of the Chinese Americans he will appreciate. Uh, uh, we had a first secretary of uh, commerce, um, uh, the, let's see, the former mayor of San Jose, the, I forgot his name. No, uh, 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 yeah, uh, Mr. Mineta. So, it, so can you imagine this is happening, history being made in front of your own eyes, many of the, uh, Mr. Mineta. And he was very active in um, AAPI and uh, we, Clinton administration actually encouraged those initiatives and he, he embraced the president, himself embraced it, president's AAPI council and all those members and all this. So I think I've seen a change and the number of uh, not only Asian uh, uh, Indians but all Asian AAP, AAPI are, are running for offices among the Muslim, American Muslim community. More than 100 candidates ran last, in the last cycle, in 2020 cycle, for various local, state, and federal offices. So many of them made it, some of them not made it. But I think the numbers is going on up in each community, not only um, American Muslim community, but also uh, Indian American community, as well as Asia, other, other uh, Chinese uh, Americans, Japanese Americans, you name it. So I think this is, the other thing is happening, the generation uh, um, X, uh, Gen X and others, I think they are, are way in terms of holding influential positions, but they're not as much into public service, quote unquote. My whole career was as a state employee, first in beginning in the 1970s, then to, uh, as a senior executive in the state government and then a political appointee in two sub-cabinet positions in Washington, D.C. But one thing, again, was there. This was a profession which uh, many of them don't appreciate, like me, my parents would have liked me to be a doctor or a lawyer, not uh, what I became. But I always enjoy it, so I have inculcated that thing in my kids, so two, two of my kids. Uh, one is, uh, is in, in federal government. Other one was uh, working for Nancy Pelosi. She was involved in writing the, and uh, Aziz, you will remember it, the ACA, or the, yes. some people call Obamacare. She was one of the prime architects under Speaker Pelosi when she was senior uh, counsel to Speaker Pelosi. So I think this is the, our way of saying returning back to the country which we call our country now. So I think this is the, what I, uh, a motto I have uh, embraced throughout my life. And I think this is what we need to encourage people and use ro role models, judge. You know, your uh, uh, narrative is so impressive. Uh, I'm impressed, so I think I'm see glad to see more younger people, Anders. Uh, you're, so I think we need more younger generations in one. Look at this room. I said earlier this morning also, uh, I'm not criticizing or saying that they should not be older people, but I think we need to encourage more younger generation, and this goes across the board, whether it be Indian Americans or Muslim Americans or other uh, uh, shades of uh, hyphenated Americans. So this is, I'll, I'll stop right now. All right, thank you. 
you use uh, you use the word insiders, and uh, I have a little bit of uh, trouble accepting your narrative wholesale, uh, because as I was talking to Judge Sinla Pasai earlier in the week, and also heard her talk uh, over lunch, clearly there are positions where we are not insiders yet. Clearly, there are roles and positions which we do not think of uh, when we think of uh, uh, the elected offices. Uh, clearly, there are places uh, that we are probably not even aware of where we can be, where we can be influential decision makers or be able to change the game, whatever it is. Tell us a little bit uh, from judiciary uh, as well as in your experience as you were going through your career making decisions or just through the decision process of sh should you even be uh, in this messy world uh, of electoral politics, which how, what goes through a mind uh, when you are in, in that, and, and then how do you come to a decision like that? You saw me take a deep sigh because it's a very good question and it's a hard question. It really requires a lot of self-reflection. I, people have been asking me to put in for over seven years before I even decided to put my name in. The hardest part is believing that you're not good enough. That's part of our culture that was ingrained into me. I had to prove myself on every level and won enough awards to fit two shelves before I even thought about possibly putting in. And it's important to understand that the judiciary seemed like a secret society to many lawyers, including myself, who was very active with our bar association on a national and on a state level. It was hard to even put the application in because you have to be your best advocate. You have to interview on multiple levels from the specialty bars who are the front lines. If you don't make that cut, you don't get to go to the next level and before you even meet with the governor. And to be elected, you had to put a packet of information together of your credentials. Mine spanned 21 years of legal professions. I had letters from Congressman Senator Wyden. I had a letters from key staff members of the governors. I had a letter from FBI because I was part of their task force. I had a letter from the U.S. Attorney's Office. And then I had letters from the state and local court, the defense bar, the specialty bar, the Oregon Asian Pacific American Bar Association, I had collectively over a hundred letters, but I was only allowed to submit eight. Think about that. That was such a struggle because those eight pages determined whether or not I was good enough. And although the governor who I, wa who I was knew exactly who I was because I was her chairwoman on the Oregon Commission of Asian Pacific Islander Affairs for the state of Oregon, she handpicked me but that was not enough. I had to go through seven levels of panels before I could even be chosen. And once I got there, and in these interviews, it's not just you, but it's your legal community, but also your community at large, the people who love you and care about you, who questions you. So your imposter syndrome really kicks in. And you're like, am I good enough? Am I smart enough? You question every question that they give you about who you are, your identity, your procedural process. And the judiciary is, a is in, it's impartial. Where we are appointed in Oregon, then you are elected. I have no loyalty to anyone except for the law and the constitution that I must interpret. It was difficult. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about what that decision-making process is, what that should be, what your observations about other Asian Americans is, and general thoughts around that space. Um, thank you for that question. First of all, I think one of the most important question for those who are thinking about serving in the public arena whether as an elected or as an appointed official, um, 
is to think about why you want to do this. Why do you want to get elected? Or why do you want to be appointed? The reason why you want to serve in that office and what that means to you? Who do you want to work for? And what difference you're trying to make? And more importantly, whose life do you want to change? Now, I still remember at the very beginning of my public um, career, and I was uh, appointed as a planning commissioner in my city, a very small city, about 23,000 people, but yet 53% of our populations are Asian Americans. And at the time when I was appointed, I was the only one who was Asian American. When I first landed on that job, the first time I sit on uh, a dais with a microphone in front of me, I was instantly dropped into this, this huge project uh, that is a transit-oriented development next to a BART station with 400 units you know, waiting to be approved, um, a few hundred thousand square feet of office space and a hotel. I mean, you can imagine. I mean, it was a massive development for a town that is three square miles. I find that relatively overwhelming at the very beginning of it. That was 2017. Fast forward five years from then, in 2022, that project is slated to complete before the end of the year, where 400 units of residential space is coming in. A hundred of which, which I have negotiated to be below market rate housing. I got phone calls coming from those who are in our constituency as well as those who want to be a part of our constituency and say, hey, um, Council Member Fung, thank you for approving that project. Because now I have an opportunity to apply for a below market rate housing for my mother, who is a senior, who gets to be close to their grandkids every day, who gets to be in the community center where they can participate in that senior lunch program. They get to see her friends again. They can be walking distance to see her friends and family who otherwise you would have no way of seeing them. And then I instantly, light bulb went off. It's like, you know, I do this job because some oldie, old lady's life just got a little bit better. Some kids just get to see their grandma a little bit more often. Perhaps she can now participate in that kid's soccer practice and see the kids playing soccer and basketball on a Thursday evening. It is that level where you could be a part of changing and making better someone else's life and making a difference that will change someone's lives forever. And that is the high honor, a distinctive high honor of my own, and I have an opportunity to do that in the public office arena in a town that is three by three square mile. And that's what I take to bed every day thinking, that's, that's worth it. No matter how many people go on social media and yell at me being the first Asian American immigrant to be elected in office and how I only care about the lives of the Asian Americans rather than everybody else. Part of being in the eyes of the public, living in the eyes of the public is to subject to that criticism because we live in a country where we respect free speech. But be there as it may, I wake up every day thanking that 4,746 people who voted for me and put me in this position and let me have that chair because I can continue to make these children, these seniors' lives, just a little bit better. And that's 
what it means to serve in, as a public official. Thank you. Aziz, the reason I shared that elaborate introduction of yours of covering DC for 35 years and having interviewed candidates and whatnot is because you have seen this game the longest, as far as I can tell, amongst any one of us. You have also seen it from the, you've, you've not been a player yourself, but you've seen the players play. What's changing? What makes people successful? You have seen various people peter out, take off. Tell us, tell us the patterns you notice of success <coughs> and warn us of the pitfalls. Uh, when I started as a rookie, uh, when I started as a rookie reporter for India Abroad in the early 1980s, uh, you know, you could just count on your fingers. You didn't even need both hands, just one hand would do uh, the number of Asian Americans uh, in public service. Uh, those who, let alone, they were, there were no congressmen or senators or a half Indian American vice president. Uh, <laughs> There was, I still remember, there was one guy called Neil Dillon who was chief of staff for uh, Congressman Robert Matsui. And there was another congressional staffer on the Appropriations Committee called Amit Pandya. They were the only two guys, you know, in Congress when I started. Uh, and, and how I started uh, covering Congress and uh, administration was when my uh, pioneering trailblazer, publisher, owner of India Abroad, Gopal Raju said, we've got to get away from the ethnic mold of this newspaper and become mainstream and cover US-South Asia relations and also the burgeoning Indian American community. And today I would say there has been a sea change. Uh, you know, you, it's unbelievable the number of congressional staffers and now you have, and I'm speaking specifically about the Indian American community, you've got uh, four US lawmakers, uh, Ami Bera uh, from Sacramento, uh, Ro Khanna from Silicon Valley, uh, Pramila Jayapal, uh, and then Raja Krishnamurti. And then we've got the half Indian American uh, who is the vice president and US senator too, before she uh, was chosen as vice president. So this has been a sea change and the number of congressional staffers among Asian Americans and Asian American lawmakers, so much so that Chinese American Judy Chu, who heads up the Congressional Asian Pacific Islander Caucus in Congress, and then Pramila Jayapal, who is the chairwoman of the Progressive Caucus, which has over 100 members, and even Ro Khanna, Raja Krishnamurti, Ami Bera, who serve on very influential committees, foreign affairs, armed services, the intelligence committees, etc. So there has been a sea change, and I think Asian Americans are punching way, way above their weight. And not just on the Hill, but also in the administration, when you think of the numbers, and the numbers of uh, co candidates who run for Congress, who run at the local level for state positions, for city council positions, for mayoral positions, etc. But at the same time, there is absolutely no way you can be complacent. And uh, the point was very well taken when the judge spoke about the fact that in the judiciary, we are totally, totally underrepresented. Uh, I know Sri Srinivasan was in the running for a Supreme Court uh, during the Obama administration, and then we've had other uh, great legal minds like, uh, you know, Neil Katyal, who, who is a a contributor on MSNBC and going through all these legal legalese. And then we had Preet Bharara, who was probably tipped to be Attorney General. Uh, and then Donald Trump, in fact, held him on and then fired him. Uh, but there's no reason for complacency, and especially at a time when we found that Asian Americans, Indian Americans, and other groups belonging to the Asian American uh, community were doing so well with achievements, etc. And more importantly, had entered the realm of public service. It was not easy because there was the first generation, the baby boomers, uh, you know, who were establishing themselves. They were the first wave of immigrants, and they wanted to establish themselves before getting politically involved. Now they are politically empowered. Uh, and you had the Gen Xers who then went into public service. 
you know, they could have easily gone and gone into medicine, gone into a whole lot of other professions, making a lot of money, but there is that sense of commitment in public service. But at the same time, uh, uh, the point that Anders was making in terms of uh, you just cannot jump into it. You know, you've got to go through the process, you've got to pay your dues. Uh, it's good that we've got a huge amount of interns working on the Hill and who are learning the process and educating the larger community in terms of what the process is all about. Uh, you know, as Kumar Barwe, who is the longest serving Indian American legislator, he was elected to the Maryland House of Delegates in 1990. He's called the grand old daddy of uh, Asian American legislators and went on to be House Majority Le Leader also. He says that before you think of running for political office, you know, uh, you know, it's good to, you run for dog catcher first, or you know exactly what it takes to get a stop sign. You know, so this process is very important. And I think at the local level, as former Speaker Tip O'Neill said, you know, all politics is local. I think it's very important because that's where a lot of decisions which affect our community uh, happens, you know. And this is where you can also affect change in terms of uh, all kinds of xenophobia that crops up whenever there is a situation of either unemployment or, you know, the, the pandemic was a classic example you know, like when we were chatting about, uh, you know, what we were probably going to speak about at this panel discussion, I said it's almost like an entire civil rights struggle all over again. You know, you just can't imagine the kind of hate-filled, you know, bigotry and uh, sort of xenophobia that has manifested itself. Just at a time that we thought that we've made it, we've come of age, you know. So I think that's very important. And the point that the judge made in a very inspiring remarks and also uh, on this panel, that we have to be sort of spread out among all realms of this. Uh, the, and the judiciary is very, very important if we are to alleviate the uh, conditions of our community. Thank you. Um, earlier during the day at different times, both of you said something which was quite interesting. One president introducing to the other and saying he is mine now. You talked a little bit about one foot here and one foot there. When you run for an office, especially a bigger, more visible office, how do you address concerns of dual loyalty? How do you address concerns of being that outsider who cannot be trusted? What should our kids be doing? What should I be doing if I'm interested in running to address the, f the foreigner label on me. Do you want to go first? Thank you. So, so that's, that was the question which was more openly and sometimes not so openly asked or raised when in the 30s and 40s, but I don't think I see that being raised. People, just what Aziz said, number of people who are either already in the positions uh, or they are running for, uh, and this, this is a process which actually, uh, I would say if I were to anywhere in the world, I would be in the US than any other country in the world. This is a system which embraces diversity, in spite of all the th shortcomings of this uh, experiment in progress in democracy. This is still the best. So I think this is human nature, uh, when some, the, you only few of us were here, uh, then uh, I think Aziz and I both uh, talked about uh, in our previous conversations. Uh, we actually, these names of uh, Krishna Murthy or Islam Siddiqui, they were actually sounded strange in the 60s and 70s. Now no one has this question about these long names of, you know, of, of uh, us. Uh, acceptance in private sector. Uh, you are talking about government, uh, even in private sector, all these CEOs of many of these companies. So I think we can always look at the glass half full, uh, but that's, that's one point. Other point is we have to prove ourselves. If you are you're coming uh, into a new town or new country, you have to prove yourself that you have what it takes to pro do the job. So I've never held a uh, run for office, but the appointee position I've been, I always had to prove myself. And I think once you, they see you can deliver the goods, people will trust you and you have uh, ethics 
and you hard uh, hard working, I think people will accept you. That's the way I've done uh, my uh, throughout my career. Uh, you have to deliver 110 percent in order to get the job. Thank you. I mentor a lot of young lawyers um, and law students, and that's a question that I often get. I actually had a young uh, Jewish woman <clears throat> who just came from Ukraine and Russia, being half Russian, half Ukraine. And she told me, shared with me, that it was really hard for her to apply for law school. And she took a couple years out because she thought that she had to fit a mold and to change everything that she was and everything that she believed in to become a lawyer. My advice always to anybody who is in the public eye is always to be your authentic self. What you bring to the table is special to you to help diversify the lens. For me, it was the lens of the judiciary. The fact that I was the only person appointed in Oregon history with an immigration background highlighted all some of the fractures that we had in how laws and policy were being applied to our community. In addition, it also helped shape, for me, my love language is food. You know, part of the Asian culture, we feed each other. When my first year as a bench member, I held the API food festival in the courthouse. It blew people away. As one of 38 appointed judges, I had API Heritage Month where we cooked Asian food. It brought the staff together. We had a conversation about the diversity of the people who worked in the courthouse. And this is how we continue to help pave and change ways, is being true to who you are. That's critical. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question about um, the feeling of an immigrant, which, if I may just kind of take a moment, have a little latitude from everybody, I want to share another story with you. And that happens to me uh, six months into my office uh, as a council member. I went to my dentist, and there's a dental hygienist who, she's a Chinese-American immigrant. She came from China. She is um, a mother of two with her husband. And then she recognized me. I think maybe it's because of all the campaigning. And we started to talk before She's not cleaning my teeth. And I ask her where she lives, you know, uh, and, and, you know, how are you doing these days? And she was very ecstatic and, and enthusiastic and tell me, oh, you know, Council Member Fung, I just moved into a city called San Carlos. I used to live in San Francisco in the Sunset District where all the Chinese people are. Now I just moved to this white people neighborhood called San Carlos. Then I instantly a breaker in my head tripped. You realize what she just said? Is that I move into this white people neighborhood called St. Carlos. It is that mindset of a perpetual foreigner that we as an Asian American, as a sort of a mortal minority, where we, you know, we feel complacent and comfortable living in a community where all of us look alike, and when yet we move into a different neighborhood, we brand that as we moving into a white people's neighborhood. And she does that. So I ask her the question, right? Why do you do that? Why, why, why do you move to this white people neighborhood? I kind of string her along a little bit. Why do you move into this you know, white people neighborhood? Oh, you know, the schools are great. You know, the lawns are a little bit cleaner. And, you know, you don't see too many people hanging their laundries in, in their backyard. I mean, it, it's, think about that. I mean, it's a very real day-to-day -day thing, right? It's, it has to do with your lifestyle. But then I started to explain to her, I said, um, Julie, that's her name, um, St. Carlos, now it's your neighborhood. You live there. You belong there. You are part of them. It's all of you. You didn't move into a white people neighborhood. You move into a city called San Carlos, which you now are part of, and you are, should 
if not already, become a registered voter and actively participate in local civic affairs so that your kids' lives can get better. You need to make sure your voices is heard because you are one of them now. And she looked at me and, and just draw the blank. Uh, what, what are you talking about, Councilman Fong? I, I, it, it's so, it's incumbent upon all of us to feel belong. Because wherever you are, wherever you happen to be, and wherever you will be, that's your home, and that's your community, and you're a part of it. Taking a cue from that personal anecdote and the experience you had, I think it's also very important that we forge coalitions with other minorities. Uh, if people haven't seen the movie uh, Mississippi Masala by Mira Naya, I think it was a movie ahead of its time. You know, and we've got to address some of the demons that our community also has. Uh, let's face it, for a long time, uh, the older generation of the Indian American community didn't embrace the African American community. And, and there were all these historical precedents that it should have been something that came naturally. Martin Luther King, you know, his whole movement, the Satyagraha movement was based on Mohandas Gandhi. And so was good travel congressman <coughs> Uh, Louis, but now I'm so happy to find that there is an embrace of the African American community and the kind of, you know, old hangovers that we had has quietly dissipated and we are all in this together. And there are also times I think it's important and I think it's good that this debate has begun. You know, just because someone is Asian American or Indian American, it's not sort of bounden of the community to support that candidate. I issues of concern, issues are very, very important. I remember covering the whole Mike Honda and Ro Khanna duel that was happening, you know. Uh, here was Ro Khanna, this young, uh, you know, upstart in a sense, uh, coming up against Mike Honda, who was revered by the Indian American community, you know, because he'd been so good to the community. So there is a time sometimes when the community gets split because it's issues that are of concern that have to be addressed. And uh, forgive me for not being bipartisan enough, you know, let's not forget that Bobby Jindal and uh, Piyush Bobby Jindal and Nimrata Nandava, who became Nikki Haley, uh, both were governors in the South, in South Carolina and Louisiana. But there was the younger generation, the Gen Xs, who were totally opposed to them. And in a sense, I think justifiably so, because their policies on immigration, on things like uh, a women's right to choose, was so alien to what the Indian American community and also the larger Asian American community was all about. So I think it's very healthy for us to be involved in that debate because that's how I think we become more wholesome mm. and we can be more accepting that these are things that make us feel that we are really part of the mainstream. Mm. That's quite encouraging. One other thought before we go to the um, audience for questions if they have any, which is, uh, Aziz, you said, just when you thought we have arrived, and I want to dovetail that with what we are seeing unfold geopolitically, China, China Taiwan conflict, China-India conflict, India-Pakistan conflict. So just when we thought we have arrived, now we are starting to see these factions build up within our own community. How do we, in the, and, and by the way, these differences will only grow at least for the next decade. How do we prepare ourselves as candidates? What advice do we give to our candidates of how not to other each other? Right? How do we avoid othering each other, given what is unfolding around us? Please, Simara. 
As communities get large number, I think when we were small, like as we were talking about earlier, uh, it, there was a more possibility of us working together. Uh, I've seen this segmentation in the Indian American community. Uh, same thing is happening with the Muslim American, where there are some uh, Islamic centers are called, this is Afghan center, this Arab center, this is Indian Muslim center. So all these things are happening. Uh, but I think in political arena, civic engagement, uh, I don't see as much, uh, at least what my, based on my experience, but I think this, this is not good, it's not healthy. And I think some of the politics of back home, when it comes to these shores, what, you know, which is our new home, actually is going to complicate more what's happening in Pakistan or what's happening in India is going to test our what I call secular, democratic, uh, pluralistic. If we want to enjoy these benefits here, we cannot close your eyes what's happening in China or what's happening in India. So I think and this is very important for us to be, that, that test our sincerity and determination that we are the citizens of the world's oldest democracy and it's work in progress. But I tell you, the things which uh, are happening now in America I think this is testing the, the fault lines are uh, getting bigger and this concerns me. Mm. I, have, I don't have a solution for you, but I, it is, should be of concern to all people who believe in democracy and, uh, and we want to keep it one, mm. one of the hundreds of years. This is something that repeats historically over and over again, but what is happening right now seems to trickle in every generation. And when we talk about two feet, when I say we have a foot in each part of the world, that is a strength, but it's also something that we need to reflect upon on how we want to move forward as a nation. And I'm really talking to our young people at this time, because some of our older generations, we're really, we're, we're stubborn. We have our, or we don't want to budge. And sometimes our elders, they'll shut down. So I'm going to ask many of our Gen Zs here and our Gen X to help talk to our families, to have them open up and look at how we can move forward. Like my dad always says, we may be fighting at war against each other because in Laos, that's what happened during the war. We were split into two. But if you saw your brother bleeding, what would you do? Would you help him? The answer is always yes. And that's how we have to see each other moving forward, find the core values. Something I'd like to share, and I want to thank Your Honor for your comment. Just to kind of piggyback on that a little bit. Um, standing from my perspective and, and casting the lens of an elected official in, in an attempt to um, craft and an advocate for public policy, one of the important things that we all need to keep in mind uh, is what we do today, who it impacts. Most of the work that we do today isn't going to change the life of most of us here on this table. I mean, our, our life is it's on a steady course, right? But what's important to realize here, and I tell everyone who comes you know, in front of my path, is that the youth and the next generation needs to get heavily involved in this because guess what? You're going to inherit everything that we do today. All the policy, whether it's housing policy, transportation policy, you know, things that surround equity, inclusivity, accessibility. It all has to do with our future generation, and that's why earlier today I was able to have an opportunity to speak to some of our youth leaders and explain to them how important it is for them to get involved because you are going to inherit it, you're going to own it moving forward. But part of my campaign pledge when I was running at 2020, and I continue to do that today, is to bring about the next generation of bench leaders and how they can you know, carry on that torch. Hopefully they can be better, and to be bigger and more assertive and more involved and more capable than we all are. 
it's our job to ensure that our next generation is better than us. And that's our only way to define our success in this generation. So that's kind of my takeaway of it. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? All right, so uh, here's what we'll do. Maybe in about 45 seconds to a minute, if you folks have closing arguments uh, or closing remarks, uh, let's take those. The idea was what advice, what guidance can we leave the audience with who either themselves may be considering a run or definitely are going to be mentors to their community kids. How can they help to get more of us elected to offices? I think in some ways, uh, despite the, the polarization of the last four to six years and everyone getting into their own little bubbles and into their own little compartments and becoming, and, and where this kind of othering, foreign, you know, xenophobia, uh, whether it be Islamophobia, Hinduphobia, and all the racial attacks and all that uh, has been horrifying. And like I was telling you, you know, are we, is it a civil rights struggle all over again? You know, just when we thought that we have arrived. What makes me optimistic is, uh, especially in the younger generation, it has brought forth a generation of activists who have taken it up as a challenge and where they are very well versed in what America is all about. Uh, they know what the Constitution is all about. They know what the rules of the game are. And in that sense, they have challenged all that has been happening. It's been horrifying, no doubt about it. But I think in that sense, in some ways, there is hope for optimism that this young generation, you know, earlier on, uh, and, and, and I think uh, for a long time, we had this sort of tired old baggage of the old politics of our origins uh, being played out here and causing a lot of factionalism and all that. And where we have so much to offer in terms of the plurality, the secularism, and all that kind of thing, but it was all this politics from the tired old baggage from home being played out here. But I think the younger generation gives hope for optimism in the sense that they are challenging uh, mm. all this othering, this foreignness, and saying, no, we are American. And this is exactly what we are entitled to, uh, what we have to fight for, and they are willing to fight for it. You know, and I think the fact that a lot more of them have got involved in public service, running for elected office, and being catalyzed into doing so because of the, some of the horrifying things that have happened and some of the polarization that has happened, I think it it's, gives hope that maybe we can fight this otherization. And there is a willing uh, segment of the younger population which is willing to do so. Thank you. Uh, my advice to the younger generation is to be involved. And number two, uh, don't have to start, and this is a phenomenon which sometimes see in the Indian American and Muslim American community. They'll run for the first office they'll run will be for the House of Representatives. I think this mentality uh, is, is one I've seen very few who succeed more than us. But then always they will throw this thing. But Obama did it. Why can't I? So this is, this is or Trump did it. So they turned, Trump didn't run for any office. But uh, what, what I'm about to say is I think getting your feet wet on the ground, whether it be city council or even uh, education board, PTAs and all this, get involved in city council meetings and even attending those meetings. See what the, whether you like or want to be serving in their capacity in terms of public service. So having been in public service, I think this is the satisfaction I saw in mentoring some of the people. And also always having a law degree helps in holding law office. Law degree helps, yep. <laughs> My advice to all of you is to be fearless, even when your voice shakes and your hands are sweating. Stand up for the things that you love and care for, because no one has the lens that you have lens for. And I want you to know, uh, for the elders in our community, 
I would ask that you look at ways in creating scholarships to lift our youth, to be in spaces where they can learn from you. And when we say we lift as we climb, we truly must lift by sharing with them the stories of our failures, our success, and to not live in the area of shame that we often dwell in in our community, and to have those honest conversations that our kids can be the best version that we can't be. Thank you. I want to close with this a bit of a narrative, and I beg the audience for giving me a little latitude for it. We live in this country called the United States of America, not the United Kingdom of America, which means we live in a democracy. There's no entitlement. We have to participate. Democracy is a, it's not a spectator sport. You gotta get engaged. You gotta be a part of it. You gotta throw yourself into it. Only when you participate and lead would changes be made. And it's incumbent upon us to be a leader, to lead our people, because our people deserve good leadership. And that's why many of us serve in public office in a capacity that we all do. Because, because people deserve good leadership. Public office come and gone. We don't inherit anything in this country, right? You know, long after, long after we leave this office, the things that we do take with us is knowing that the changes that we make today benefits not just us, but the generation beyond us. In my mind, why I want to be in public service is because I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I don't necessarily worry about where my next meal is coming from. But I believe that a life well lived is a life to serve not yourself, but others. Because at some point, I want to see our next generation, Asian Americans and beyond, to take that leadership position, to be able to lead this country and our community to a better place, and continue to make those changes that benefits everybody else. And that's what being in public office is about. Thank you. Thank you. You've been a brilliant panel. panel. I apologize again for running a little over, um, but let's do this. Let's see what's going on in the other panel. I hope they are done. Uh, we'll take a 10-minute break and get started with the next panel, 4.30.